person that day. I get a burger. Do you mind closing that door? Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see everybody here. Good and uh, good, to, good, to, good to be in the house of God, and we're opening up the Word of God. If you would please, to John chapter 5, verse 17. John 5, 17, as we continue to study the wonderful words of our of our wonderful Lord, Christ himself. So, so prepare, let's pray. Father, we come to you because, Lord, your name is wonderful. Wonderful counselor. Counsel us this morning through your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, John chapter 5, verse 17. But Jesus answered them, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but that what he seeth the Father do, what things, for what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son and showeth them all things that himself doeth, and he will show them greater things, works than these, that ye may marvel. For as the Father raises up the dead, and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word, believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself and have given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. I can of mine own self do nothing, as I hear I judge, my judgment is just because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. Now, in this chapter, chapter 5, Jesus Christ has done a great miracle of giving life to a man's dead feet and his dead legs. And in that miracle, Christ himself showed himself to be the life giver. In that miracle, he showed himself to bring Light and light, light of healing to a sick world, just as he is described in John 1 4. John 1 4, where it says, Two things were in him. In him was life, and the light was the light of men. Both life and light. That's how Jesus Christ presented himself to the world of religion that was centered in Jerusalem as light and life. That's how Jesus Christ came unto his own Jewish people in John 1.11. John 1.11, what it says, he came unto his own. He came unto his own as life and light. And you would have thought, you would have thought that they would have welcomed him as his own because they were in a state of the opposite. Instead of light, they were in a state of darkness. Instead of light, they were in a state of death as described. In Isaiah 9.2, Isaiah 9.2, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. The rabbis in Israel were walking in the darkness of their own religion that they had made into a burdensome system of 613 laws of Judaism that had to be kept, as they said, in order to make God happy. And the type of, that type of works religion uh, was then, and that type of works religion is now today. 
a burdensome land of darkness, as Job said in Job 10.22, Job 10.22, a land of darkness as darkness itself. Because any religion that, that says that a person can work themselves into heaven by doing good works is a religion of darkness. And Jesus Christ came as the light of the world to dispel that darkness and show many, many, many that that in order for a man to enter into heaven, he's got to follow God's way of believing into God through Jesus Christ. And the rabbis had made for the Jewish people a place of death, as it says in Matthew 23, 27. Matthew 23, 27. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like unto whited sepulchers or graves which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Jesus Christ came to call them out, come out of that state of death into life. And that's how Jesus Christ came to his own. He came to his own as light and life. But when Jesus Christ came to the capital city of his own, which is Jerusalem, that was life and light coming to the city to call the people out of darkness, to call the people out of death, you would have thought that the rabbis and the religious leaders would have welcomed Christ as the Savior from death and darkness. But the reception that Jesus Christ got when he came to Jerusalem was, John 1.11, John 1.11, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. The reception that Jesus Christ got when he came to Jerusalem was verse 16, verse 16 in this chapter. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. The light giver, the light giver was pursued. The chase was on. The rabbis became his enemies who set about to run him down and kill him. And when Jesus Christ thought about, when Jesus Christ thought about, why? Why do they hate me? He said in John 15, 25, John 15, 25, they hated me without a cause. There was no reason for them to hate him. He did nothing that would have warranted them to hate him. It was a hatred without a cause. All Jesus Christ did was to restore health to one of their own people, and for that, they chose to chase him down to kill him. But if you ask them why they hated him, they would have said, we hate him for two reasons. First, because he refused to follow our rules for the Sabbath. They hated Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ refused to validate the rabbis who step way out on a limb to the people to make all these, these, these overextended, their own man-made laws about Sabbath. As a matter of fact, Jesus Christ condemned the rabbis to the people. He called them hypocrites in, in Matthew 6.2. Matthew 6.2. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, alms do not song, sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues, and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Matthew 6, 5, he condemned them. Matthew 6, 5, when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites. For they love to pray, standing in the streets, standing in the corners of the streets, standing in the synagogues, that they may be seen of men. Matthew 6, 16, he condemns them. Matthew 6, 16, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. So Jesus Christ was not afraid to openly criticize the rabbis, and that made him to be hated by them and, and, and because they held the power. It reminds me of when I was in the lobby of the Hilton Hotel in, in the capital city of Ethiopia, Addis Ababa. And uh, at that time then, at that time now, the wealthiest man in Addis Ababa was a uh, half Ethiopian, half Saudi, named Sheikh Mohammed. And there is a law 
in Ethiopia. The, Ethiopia has gold, and there's a law that states that it's illegal to take gold, to eat the gold out of the land of the country of Ethiopia. So I was in the lobby there, and I was shooting off my mouth and <laughs> criticizing Sheikh Mohammed because it was well known about how he made his wealth by, by smuggling gold out of the country of Ethiopia. And I was talking to some man about that, and, and, and I guess I could be heard by others, and another Ethiopian man came up to me and tapped me on the shoulder and said, you better stop talking. He said, people are hearing you. It's dangerous for you. And I stopped talking. <laughs> it was dangerous for Christ to call the rabbis hypocrites. But Jesus Christ did not stop talking. And we've just seen, uh, 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 and, and what we've seen here is how this triggered the rabbis to hate him and pursue him to death. Now, this last week, I think it was last week, we experienced uh, the solar eclipse. The solar eclipse where the moon blocked out the light of the sun. I mean, some of us saw it. I, I guess I missed it. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, what can you see from inside of the airport anyway? Uh, anyways, but at that time, the moon eclipsed the light of the sun and, because the moon got in front of the sun. And so when Jesus Christ performed miracles, Jesus Christ eclipsed the rabbis and people started to follow Jesus Christ instead of the rabbis. And it was said in John 3, 2, John 3, 2, that rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God for no man can do these miracles except God be with him. And that was the miracles that eclipsed the rabbi's glory. And, the, and when Jesus Christ taught, Jesus Christ eclipsed the rabbis, as it says in Matthew, in, in, in Mark 1.22, Mark 1.22, they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority, not as the scribes. So when Jesus Christ eclipsed the rabbis, this made the rabbis jealous and envious, and that envy was so obvious that even Pilate saw it in Matthew 27, 18, Matthew 27, 18, for Pilate knew that for envy they had delivered him. Envy, jealousy, is murderous. Proverbs 6, 34, Proverbs 6, 34, jealousy is the rage of a man Therefore, he will not spare in the day of vengeance. So, when the rabbi saw the, the following that Jesus Christ had was getting, they became like Saul in, in, in their jealousy, like, uh, like Saul was jealous against David in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel 18, 7. 1 Samuel 18, 7. The women answered one another as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very wroth, and the saying displeased him. And he said, they've ascribed unto David ten thousands, but to me they've ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day forward, and it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied in the midst of the house, and David played with his hand as at other times, and there was a javelin in Saul's hand. And Saul cast the javelin, for he said, I'll smite David even to the wall with it. And David avoided out of his presence twice. That's what jealousy does. That's what envy does. And, and they were jealous and envious. Now we read in verse 17, verse 17, Jesus answered them, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. In that word, that one word, answered, but Jesus answered, we don't read of anything that the rabbis there said to him, but that word answered tells us that Jesus Christ was probably called now to appear before the great Jewish court of the Sanhedrin. This will be the court, the Sanhedrin, that will later issued the death sentence for Jesus Christ. But here seems to be his first appearance 
of Jesus Christ before the court of the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem. And he, and he, and he seems to be called to answer the charge of verse 16. Verse 16, he had done these things on the Sabbath day. And what we see in verse 17 is Jesus Christ being accused of doing these things on the Sabbath day. These things, there's two things that we're talking about here. First, Jesus Christ is accused of working himself on the Sabbath day by doing this work of healing the paralyzed man. And second, Jesus Christ was accused of telling that healed man to do work of carrying his bed away on the Sabbath. So it was to these charges, these two charges, that Jesus Christ is called now to give an answer. So verse 17, Jesus Christ is responding to the charges of working on the Sabbath day and commanding a man to work on the Sabbath. This breaking of the Sabbath will be the, the prime accusation that Jesus Christ will be charged with many times by the rabbis. And this to this charge, he will give many defenses to this accusation. And, and in each of those defenses that he gives to those accusations of breaking the Sabbath, he will appeal to the rabbis to stop and think. Stop and think. The Bible is an appeal to us to think. Dead religion is, a, is an appeal to don't think, just do. But the Bible says, no, think and do. Now, one appeal that Jesus Christ will make to them to think about will be Matthew 12, 2, Matthew 12, 2. When the Pharisees saw it, they said unto them, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. But he said unto them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, and they that were with him, how he entered into the house of God, and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them that were with him, but only for the priests. Now, when Jesus Christ said that, when Christ said that, Christ was asking the rabbis, Think, think about the fact that David did that which was not lawful to do, and he was blameless, and God never said that David did anything wrong. And speaking of the priests, Christ went on further with his appeal to think again, think again, when he said in Matthew 12, 5, Matthew 12, 5, have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath, and they're blameless, blameless. Again, he's saying, think about this. He's referring to what the priests do on the Sabbath day. What they do on the Sabbath day is described in Numbers 28.9, Numbers 28.9, where God said, And on the Sabbath day, two lambs of the first year without spot and two-tenths deal of flour for a meat offering mingled with oil and the drink offering. This is the burnt offering of every Sabbath beside the continual burnt offering with the drink offering. So that verb, that, that command in Numbers 28, 9 and 10, God is saying two lambs had to be offered on the Sabbath day as burnt offerings. Now, a burnt offering takes a lot of work the priests have to do this work of bringing the lambs, killing the lambs on the Sabbath day. They had to, on the Sabbath day, they had to build the fire. You can't have a burnt offering without fire. So they had to build the fire on the altar on the Sabbath day. And making a fire on the Sabbath day was expressly prohibited in Exodus 35.3. Exodus 35.3. You shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations upon the Sabbath day. So, Christ is asking the rabbis, think about this. Think about how the law says it's prohibited to make a fire on the Sabbath day, but God commanded the priests make a fire on the Sabbath day to make the lambs a burnt offering. All of this was done by the priest in the very temple of Jerusalem, where Christ was there. 
at that time. And with these examples, Christ is, is telling the rabbis that it's not wrong to do on the Sabbath if what God commands work to be done on the Sabbath. It's not wrong to do a work on the Sabbath if God commands a work to be done on the Sabbath. And the same God that instituted the Sabbath laws has the same power and authority to change the Sabbath laws. And in another place, Christ saw that he is that God that, that instituted those Sabbath laws. When he said about himself in Matthew 12, 8, Matthew 12, 8, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Same holds true for the dietary laws. God instituted the dietary laws in, 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 of, of against well, fish that don't have scales and fins. That they, you shouldn't eat those, like lobster <laughs> and and, uh, and crab and, uh, and scallops and uh, everything is seafood. And shrimp. <laughs> I forgot shrimp. Don't forget shrimp. Most popular fish eaten in America is fish. That is shrimp. And uh, and pork, which in my opinion is is one of the best meats to eat. It's fantastic. But anyway, um, um, start thinking about food. I get very distracted. <laughs> but um, I mean to say that the, that God said. No, you don't eat those things. Let's say chew the cud and have a cloven hoof. Can't eat it. But in Acts, the same God who made those laws said, I change them. And now you eat them, Peter. You eat everything. And I'm glad he did that. I'm glad I'm living on this side of Acts. <laughs> not that other side, anyway. Amen. All right, now, in another appeal to reason, Christ, in another encounter about the Sabbath, he said in Luke 13, 14, Luke 13, 14, the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day and said unto the people, there are six days in which men ought to work, and then therefore come and be healed, not on the Sabbath day. The Lord then answered him and said, thou hypocrite, doth not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox and his, or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? Ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound all these 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed, and all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. Speaking to the religious leaders, he's asking them about the facts. Says, Listen, when your animal is really thirsty on the Sabbath day, you're going to sit there and let him cry out because he doesn't have any water, or are you going to take him? You take him, you loose him, you lead him, to get water, to, to meet his need. This woman is crying out to be healed of her, her disease. And shouldn't she be loosed and, 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 and have a satisfaction of her need? Yes. Now, that was an appeal to reason. He was thinking, think about it. There was another time when Christ appealed to reason regarding the Sabbath, and that was in Matthew 12, 10. Matthew 12, 10. Behold, there was a man which had his hand withered, and they asked him, saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days that they might accuse him? They set him up. And, and he said unto them, what man shall there be among you that have one sheep, and if it fall into the pit on the Sabbath day, will they not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much then is this man better than a sheep? Wherefore, it's lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. And then he saith to the man, stretch forth thine hand, he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole like as the other. Then the Pharisees went out, held a counsel against him, how they might destroy him. But when he knew it, he withdrew himself. So, again, challenging the religious leaders, think what you do if you found a tragic accident had, help, had happened, and you saw one of your sheep laying in a ditch on the Sabbath, you're going to get him out of the ditch. And here Christ is saying that he's come across the tragedy of a man with a withered hand, and he's rescued the man with the withered hand on the Sabbath. And when, and when he did that, the people were thrilled, and they followed him. And you can see the people saying, at last someone has unchained our intellect to be able to think. And the, but the response of those leaders, they weren't thinking at all. They were thinking about is how, how we can destroy him because envy and jealousy had, was heightened 
when they saw the people follow him and thrilled to not be under the bondage of the religious leaders who were in, 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 enslaving them with all these laws. Now, by this time, when Christ answered to the accusation that he had broken the Sabbath, he gave, in, in our chapter 5, he gave the highest reason uh, 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 of why he broke the Sabbath when he said in verse 17, verse 17 our chapter of John, John 5, Jesus answered them, my father worketh too, and I work. With that statement in verse 17, my father worketh too, and I work, he made his defense that became, he made his highest defense that became his highest offense uh, to the religious leaders. When Christ said, my father worketh, he was again challenging them to think that because he said, God the Father was working on the Sabbath day. For example, you said in Matthew 5.45, Matthew 5.45, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good. He sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. So what Christ was saying to them was God the Father was making his son to rise, S-U-N, to rise on the Sabbath day in the sky. And that's why, that, that's why, for work for God the Father, that was work, making his son to rise, S-U-N, in the sky. Every Sabbath day, the sun rises in the sky, which means that every Sabbath day, God the Father is working to make his S-U-N son rise in the sky. On the Sabbath day, Sometimes rain falls from the sky to water the earth. That means that on the Sabbath, God the Father is sending his rain to water the earth. That means God the Father is working on the Sabbath when he sends his rain to earth. So with these two examples, and there are many, but just with these two examples, God the Father is seen working on the Sabbath day. So when Christ said, my Father worketh hitherto, Christ is referring to God the Father assisting Christ to heal that paralyzed man by the pool of Bethesda on the Sabbath day. Now, when Christ called God the Father, my Father, the Jewish authorities correctly understood that Jesus Christ was calling himself the Son of God, which made him equal with God. As he, already, as he said in another place, John 10, 30, John 10, 30, I and my father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because that thou being a man makest thyself God. So when Jesus Christ called God the Father my father, they understood correctly. Because we read that in verse 18, verse 18. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. See, when Jesus Christ called God my father, the Jews correctly understood that Jesus was calling himself the son of God, which made him equal to God. And the Jews understood that then, and the Jews understand that today that calling Jesus the Son of God is the same as calling Jesus God. And that's why when, when I had my qualification interview uh, for Israeli citizenship, qualification to be granted Israeli citizenship under the right of return, which gives the right of every Jew, wherever he comes from, the right to become quickly an Israeli citizenship. When I had my qualification interview, by the Israelis for Israeli citizenship, I was asked by the Jewish agency, this is what they said, do you believe that Jesus was God or the Son of God? She said. By that question, the Jewish agency was asking, <clears throat> was saying, they were saying to me, to believe that Jesus Christ is God, or to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God is the same as believing that Jesus is God. And the nation of Israel says through their Jewish agency that if a Jew believes 
that Jesus is God, he's no longer a Jew. And since I do believe that Jesus is God, I was deemed by the nation of Israel to be no longer a Jew, and the nation of Israel barred me as a Jew from becoming an Israeli citizen under the right of return for Jews. The Jewish agency represents the Jewish nation of Israel, and this hatred of the Jewish nation of, uh, uh, against Jesus is so intense that God the Father calls that national hatred, the Israeli national hatred of Jesus Christ, to be an abhorrence. They don't just hate Jesus Christ, they abhor Jesus Christ. And this is what God the Father says, in, uh, uh, this is what God says in, in Isaiah 49, 7, Isaiah 49, 7. Thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and His Holy One, to him whom man despiseth, to him whom the nation abhorreth, to a servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes shall worship because of the Lord that is faithful and the Holy One of Israel, and he shall choose thee. But regardless of what the Jewish agency says about Jesus, what the nation of Israel says about Jesus, the Bible says about Jesus that he is Philippians 2.6, Philippians 2.6, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Colossians 1.19, Colossians 1.19, it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Regardless of the nation of Israel abhorring Jesus Christ, God the Father affirms his love of Jesus Christ, as he said in Isaiah 49.7, Isaiah 49.7, the Lord is faithful and the Holy One of Israel, he shall choose thee. The nation of Israel rejects the one whom God the Father chooses. Now, in verse 17, Jesus Christ said that because God the Father was working, that he was working also. In verse 17, Christ said that he was working together and in step with God the Father. Christ was always seeing how God the Father was working. And that inspired Christ to work also. As he said in, in John 4.34, John 4.34, 434. Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. John 9.4. John 9.4. I must work the works of him that sent me while it's day. The night comes when no man can work. That's why Jesus Christ came to earth. Jesus Christ came to earth in order to work. He came to work. And, the, and as the Messiah, Christ said that he was, John 10, 36, John 10, 36, him whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world. When God the Father sent Christ into the world, he sent Christ to earth to work. And when Christ was finished working on earth, Christ reported back to the Father and said in John 17, 4, John 17, 4, I have glorified thee on the earth, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. What a statement. Wow. I wish that each one of us, when it comes to our time, the end of our lives, that we might be able to say what he said to God the Father in John 17, 4, John 17, 4, that we could say about our lives, I've glorified you on the earth, and I've finished the work which you gave me to do. Even today, Christ has not stopped working. As today, he's working to accomplish what the Bible says, upholding all things. In Hebrews 1.3, Hebrews 1.3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself perched our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So, Christ may be sitting at the right hand of, of, of God, but he's not... Doing. He's not sitting to do no work. He's working. He's working to pray for us. As it says in Hebrews 7.25, Hebrews 7.25, he's able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. God the Father is a worker. Jesus Christ is a worker. The Bible describes also the devil as a worker. The devil's working. 1 Peter 5.8, 1 Peter 5.8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. He's working, the devil's working, and because the devil never stops working, 
to destroy us, Christ never stops working to save us from that destruction. And the works of Jesus Christ are a copy of the works of God the Father. Matthew 18, 14, Matthew 18, 14. Even so, it's not the will of your Father, which is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish. Now, Jesus, here in verse 19, he continues to stand to give his defense for healing on the Sabbath. And we, we find Christ, he's talking to his enemies here, and he's telling his enemies on the Sabbath in verse 19. Then answered Jesus, verse 19, verse, then answered Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, so he's really calling them to very serious what he has to say. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do, for what, the, what, what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. Now, Christ knows that he's standing before his enemies that want to kill him and eventually will kill him. And if you and I were in Christ's place, and we were standing before our enemies who wanted to kill us and eventually would kill us, and we knew that, what would you have said to your enemies? Would, would our response be uh, to not give them any more ammunition against us, just remain silent? Or, or, or would our response be to push back, to attack back and say something like, uh, I know that you've already made up your mind that I'm guilty, and, and I know you want to kill me. I've got your number. We learn so much about Christ when we look at what Christ said in verse 19 when he was in that position standing in front of his enemies who eventually were going to kill him. When verse 19 says, Then answered Jesus and said unto them, it shows us with those words, unto them, how Christ directed his words and, 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 and he was speaking to them directly and individually as he spoke. That was always how Christ spoke. He may have been speaking to a large crowd, but he was speaking to the individuals in those crowd, crowds, and he was speaking to the heart of the individuals, and this is what he's doing here. The response that Jesus spoke to the hearts of these individuals was gentle, it was meek, he was not being defensive in his response. He was not on the offense in his response. He was kind of speaking like a gentle lamb being led to the slaughter. Only this time he's not silent. He's saying something. The response that Jesus Christ gave in verse 19 was almost childlike. It, it, was, it was a response of like an innocence. Innocence. It was a response of gentleness, of where Christ is speaking about his most intimate relationship of love and respect between him and his closest friend, God the Father. He has opened the door. He has pulled back the drapes for these enemies to see this special relationship that he has with God the Father. The response of Christ in verse 16 to his enemies who were trying to kill him reveals how Christ purposefully made himself naive to the murderous intentions of his enemies. It was a purposeful naivety that Christ adopted that, that, that made God the Father love Christ all the more. As a matter of fact, God the Father praised Christ for his purposeful naivety, when God the Father said about Christ in Isaiah 42, 19, Isaiah 42, 19, Who is blind but my servant, or deaf as my messenger that I sent? Who is blind as he that is perfect and blind as the Lord's servant? Seeing many things, but thou observest not. Opening the ears, but he heareth not. So what God the Father was saying, in that verse, in Isaiah 42, 19, Isaiah 42, 19, was that Christ was blind, which means that Christ made himself blind. If you said to Christ, if you could say to Christ, if you could talk to Christ right there in verse 19, you could say to him, he's standing there in front of his enemies, and if you could talk to Christ and you could say, <clears throat> you could say to him, 
Don't you see that these people are your sworn enemies who are out to murder you? If you said that to Christ in verse 19, Christ would say, no, I really don't see them like that. All I see are men who really don't know what they're doing and they really need to be converted and brought to heaven. That's what he would say. Because he would say that because he made himself blind to their murderous intentions. Of course he saw, but he regarded not, as Isaiah says. He saw, in Isaiah 42, 20, Isaiah 42, 20. You got there, right? Check it out. 49, 20. Well, no, 42, 20. 42, 20. 42, 20. Seeing many things, but thou observest not. Yeah, he saw they were murderers, but he ignored the sight. And he chose to see something else about them. That is a purposeful naivety. He, Christ ignored the fact that they were his murderers, and instead he chose to see them as son, sinners, about to fall into the hands of an angry God, and he chose to see them as candidates for conversion and salvation that he wanted to give them. From that scene of Christ ignoring the offense and focusing on their need, we are challenged with the question, how do we see our enemies in life? Are we willing to ignore the offenses that our enemies have done against us and instead set our focus on them as souls that, that need Christ to be saved from hell and come to heaven? That's the question. Reminds me of my son. Reminds me of a conversation I had with my son. My son was telling me that we were talking about a person that had said some not nice words to my son and needed Christ. He was talking about a Jewish person. And I said to my son, I gave him some advice. I said, why don't you tell him that you want to see him in heaven? And my son replied, because I don't want to be with him. <laughs> 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 well, when Christ spoke to his enemies in verse 19, Christ was speaking to them as if he wanted to be with them in heaven. He wanted them to be converted from their hatred of Christ. He wanted to, for them, he wanted to be with them in eternity with heaven. It all comes down to what we see and what we choose to ignore. What we choose to focus on when it comes to our enemies, the choices between seeing our enemies as wanting to do us harm or seeing our enemies as needy souls who need to be converted to Christ and be saved from their sins. And in verse 19, Christ chose to see his enemies as in desperate need to be converted and become his friends. That's why Christ spoke to, to in verse 19, unto them as if these are my next friends. These people are gonna be my next friends. Why? Because when we were the enemies of Christ, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Greatest love to us because he looked and he said, oh, those my enemies? Oh, that man Saul of Tarsus? He's going to be my next friend right there. <laughs> Christ chose to see his enemies not as his enemies, but as, as those to be converted and become his friends. It reminds me of a missionary that we had here at the chapel for many years. Missionary to France, Rusty Young. Don remembers Rusty. Tim you remember Rusty? I don't know. Scott, you remember Rusty? No. Rusty and Norma. Yeah. Rusty, young, Rusty and Norma? Hmm. Anyway, um, I used to visit them every year in France. And uh, Rusty told me one trip, he said, uh, how he wanted to, he told me about some things that happened in the past. He said he wanted to start a, 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 a first Bible believing church in the city of Fontainebleau. Now, the Catholic city of Fontainebleau the seat of Cardinal Richelieu in history, has a terrible history of persecuting non-Catholics. In 1598, there was a, a law in France called the Edict of Nantes, Nantes, another city, and it gave the right for non-Catholics, like the Huguenots, to have their own non-Catholic churches and schools in France. It was the Edict of the Freedom of Religion. But in 1685, the Edict of Fontainebleau revoked the Edict of Nantes and made it illegal 
for there to be in France any non-Catholic churches and schools to exist in France. And all the non-Catholic churches and all the non-Catholic schools after that Edict of Fontainebleau, they were destroyed and it became legal to, to persecute non-Catholics, including the Jews. And the Huguenots were in that group. So the Huguenots uh, were skilled craftsmen, and they fled France and went to Switzerland. And by the way, the Huguenots were known for their skills in making watches, and that's why Switzerland became known as the country of watchmaking. So Fontainebleau was the center of ridding France of non-Catholics. And Rusty went to this city of Fontainebleau and met with the Catholic mayor of the city to tell the mayor that he was going to build a Bible-believing non-Catholic church in his city of Fontainebleau. And the mayor was absolutely against it and said to Rusty, and who do you think is going to come to your church? And Rusty replied, you are. <laughs> You're going to be the first person to come to my church, he said. And over the months, while Rusty was getting his church ready to open, Rusty was also working on building a relationship of friendship with that mayor of Fontainebleau. And on the opening day of Rusty's church in Fontainebleau, the mayor of Fontainebleau was there, and Rusty had him be the first person walking to the church. That was over 50 years ago. Rusty is now in heaven, been there for a long time. And that church today in Fontainebleau is still going strong today. What? Rusty's non-Catholic church is accepted in the Catholic city of Fontainebleau all because Rusty made a decision to not fight his enemy, the mayor of Fontainebleau, but to love his enemy. And this is what Christ is doing in verse 19. In verse 19, Christ is reaching out to his enemies with a hand of friendship, and he's making himself vulnerable. It will cost Christ. But for Christ, the personal cost for Christ is nothing, as he saw, compared to the value of a saved soul. So, in verse 19, Christ reveals something very intimate about himself to his enemies, and, and he tells this tribunal that he did nothing from a position of independence from God the Father. He told them that, that he was just doing what he saw God the Father doing. It shows how Christ studies God the Father. He studies God the Father to see what the intentions of God the Father are so he can align his own intentions with God the Father. Christ studies God the Father to see what are the goals, what are the purposes of God the Father, so he can align his own goals and purposes in life to be those of God the Father. He studies God the actions of God the Father, so he can align his actions to be right in step with God the Father. He aligned his intentions, his purposes, his goals, his action to be in step, so that he could say in John 14, 9, John 14, 9, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. That didn't come by accident. That came from hard work of studying intentions, goals, purposes, and actions to make sure that he became the communicator of God the Father to the world. He became the revealer of God the Father, as Christ said in Matthew 11, 27. Matthew 11, 27, all things are delivered to me of my Father. No man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. He is the revealer of God the Father by his life. Now, there are two persons who are the most misunderstood persons ever. And Christ talked about that in John 17, 25. John 17, 25, when he said, O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee. Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27, Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27, all things are delivered unto me of my Father. No man knoweth the Son, but the Father. The two mis most misunderstood persons in the world are God the Father and God the Son. Coming up, starting tomorrow, I'm going to spend this week with four lost Israelis. Who, by the way, can't go home right now because of the, what's happening over there. And I'm going to tell them how vital it is for them to come to know Christ. 
Now they're going to go to Loretto and they're going to go into the, the, the good Catholic church in Loretto and they're going to see statues and statues and statues. And, 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 and I'm going to tell them, it's vital for them to know the true Christ, not the Christ of the Catholic church. That's a false Christ. The true Christ is the God of Israel. The true Christ is the Messiah who loves them and came to earth to rescue them from danger and bring them to heaven by dying for their sins. Now we come to verse 20. And in verse 20, Christ goes further into speaking to his enemies of the most important relationship that Jesus Christ has, which is his relationship with God the Father. He's speaking about love to a people who are filled with hatred. And he's speaking about how much God loves him. And we can imagine that when Christ is speaking about how much God loves him, then a big old smile comes over the face of Christ when he says in, in verse 20, verse 20, the Father loveth the Son. And when he says that, we can see Christ thinking with, of the, of, uh, with joy of the times that he spent with God the Father. And his delightful times, as described in Proverbs 8.29, Proverbs 8.29, when he gave the seed to his degree that the water should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundation of the earth, then I was by him as one brought up with him. I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. So when Christ said that in verse 20, that his father loved him, he's smiling. And he's thinking of Proverbs 8.20. He's thinking about daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. The verse, that statement, in verse 20, the Father loveth the Son. It's so important because he's telling him, this is, this is, just a minute. Alan doesn't know that I teach here, but is it? Okay. Uh, anyway, what he's saying here, when he says the Father loveth the Son, is he's saying, this is the foundation of why God the Father has given so much to the Son. This is the foundation for what God the Father has given to the Son. Because God the Father loves the Son, loves God the Son, God the Father, verse 20, verse 20, shows him all things that himself doeth. Because God the Father loves the Son, God the Father gave to the Son, verse 21, verse 21, the Son quickeneth whom he will. That means that God the Son has been given the right to raise from the dead whoever God the Son wants to raise from the dead. Because God the Father loves the Son, God the Father has, verse 22, verse 22, committed all judgment unto the Son. That means that Jesus Christ is going to judge all. That's why the great Bema, the great judgment seat, is called the judgment seat of Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Because God the Father loves God the Son, God the Father has Philippians 2.9, Philippians 2.9, God has also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That means that God the Father was so pleased with, with Jesus when he submitted himself to die for our sins that God the Father exalted him to a point where every tongue is going to confess that he's God, Jesus Christ, and every knee is going to bow before him. It means that because God the Father loved Jesus Christ, God the Father has designed verse 23, John 5, 23, John 5, 23, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father, which is sent. Because God the Father loves God the Son, God the Father has Psalm 110, Psalm 110, verse 1. 110, verse 1, Psalm. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. That means because God the Father loves Jesus Christ so much, God has asked Jesus Christ to sit in the highest station of being at the right hand of God the Father. Because God the Father loves the Son, God the Father has Psalm 2.6, Psalm 2.6, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I'll declare the decree. The Lord said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, 
and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. That means that because God the Father loves Jesus Christ, God the Father has sent Jesus Christ to be his king, his king of the Jews, and possess all the earth for him to judge. Because God the Father loves God the Son, the Father has given to Jesus Christ all power, all authority of Matthew 28, 18. Matthew 28, 18. 28, 18. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for, Lord, the, the love that you have toward Jesus Christ. And, Lord, we, we, we pray the words of that song. May we never outlive our love for him. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.